So um, what I'd like to do is uh, review very, very briefly some, some of the biology behind active dendrites and dendrites and how we think of it and model it, because uh, it forms the basis for a lot of our work beyond sparsity. Um, and this is something originally Ben asked me, uh, or there was some, a lot of discussion on Slack about it, and, and so I thought I'd go through it. Uh, I'm not going through our current work in detail. I think that's like another meeting and Karin has talked about it in previous meetings as well, but this is sort of the basis for some of it. Um, and I, I should apologize in advance. I just slapped this together this morning from a bunch of existing slides. So I may have missed stuff out and things so, but anyway. You got a title um, slide. You're yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this, is like, I'm impressed. this is from also from another talk, but anyway. Um, and the title kind of really tries to say what, what we think is going on with dendrites and neurons. So I'm calling this the predictive neuron. The neuron is predicting stuff. And this is really um, based on active dendrites. And I'm going to try to show how active dendrites lead to prediction and context integration in neurons. And that this is a really powerful concept that can be, it's a very, very flexible concept that can be used in many, many different ways. Uh, so, but primarily this is about kind of the biological basis for this and, and a little bit of how we modeled it in, in HTM. Okay, so neurons, this <laughs> gets to the, Question Char Charmaine was just talking about. So this is the typical point neuron model. Um, so you have a uh, you have a bunch of inputs coming in. You take a weight at some of them and you pass it through some um, nonlinearity. Um, and the idea is that this happens at the soma. This integration is uh, sum, and it goes through something like a, a, some nonlinear activation function, and that's like a spike through the axon in, in biology. This was, I think, originally proposed back in 1907. And it is still the current, uh, by far the current model of how neurons works in, in computational work and deep learning. So in the perceptron in 1962, I think this was like the first actual computational model uh, that was done of neurons. They used this. And then in deep learning from 1986 through 2021, <laughs> this is still by far the, the most uh, common uh, idea. Um, but you know, as we know, this is not really what a real neuron is. Uh, it's much more complex uh, than this. This is not a neuron. Um, and so some of you may have seen this video. I've, I've shown this before. I really like this video. This shows what a real pyramidal neuron looks like. And you can show, uh, this is a 3D reconstruction. Um, and you can show that there's a really complex tree-like structure around it. And these, these are the dendrites of the neuron. And this is where inputs are received into the neuron. Um, and you can, you should be able to tell here that there's just a lot of structural complexity and there's actually a lot of functional complexity in here as well. And so first thing is that the entire neuron has thousands of synapses. And if you look at the, the point neuron piece of it, that only really covers a few hundred synapses. So the point neuron uh, idea does not really account for what's going on in the rest of these. Uh, uh, it's, it's worse than this. This is actually a picture of a uh, pyramidal cell from hippocampus. Yeah, right? that's even more. And, and I have this paper, this guy did this, and he counted actually, he got 30,000 synapses on those particular Yeah. Well, <laughs> so there's a lots of synapses. I yeah. don't know what the heck is going 30, on. 30,000. Um, and the kind of the TLDR here is that all of these dendrites are split into dozens of independent computational segments. I'm sorry, can uh, you It means too can long. Don't worry. Worry. So if, <laughs> if you just want like a quick summary. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, and these segments activate with clusters of about 10 or 20 active synapses, which is really tiny. And that essentially uh, these neurons are detecting dozens and dozens of highly sparse patterns in parallel, and these are sort of integrated in different complex ways. So this is a quick summary. Um, so this was, so the idea behind some of these active dendrites and stuff was first proposed way back in 1992 uh, in this really groundbreaking paper by Bartlett uh, Mel. And I think this is a great example of computation driving experiments because he did this completely computationally. There was, as far as I know, very little and maybe not no experimental evidence for it, but he did a, a detailed uh, compartmental model of a neuron and basically suggested that what's going on is that these, these neurons are detecting 
these uh, small patterns all over the, the dendritic arbor. Um, and this was this paper had a huge impact. It caused a lot of experimental work, and they actually verified that this actually does happen uh, in neurons. Um, so how did you come up with that theory before there was any experimental evidence for that? Um, by, by doing computational modeling. And, and there's a lot of, sort of in analogy, it's a, you know, very analogous to stuff we do here. It's just be theoretically model stuff. And there was already proposed. a lot known about modeling of dendrites. There's these, uh, they're called the cable, cable models or something like that. And so there's a lot of people trying to speculate what's going on because these are these dendrites are nonlinear. They're not just like collecting everything and adding it together. There's a lot of weird dynamics is going on in them. And so he, the introduction here was like saying, "Hey, it's not just these uh, these cabling properties." There's a it's, it wasn't in a, a total out of the yeah. out of the blue, but it, it was a big advance. Yeah, actually, I can give you a little more color on this since since I was in the same lab as Bartlett. He did his PhD thesis on the robotics thing, and he came up with these sigma pi units, which were completely divorced from the biology, but a way of uh, doing sort of um, uh, reference frame transformations in, in effect with robotic arms. Um, and he, he had this sort of multiplicative units followed by summation, and that led to this robot arm doing things. And so I think he had been thinking about this idea from a computational standpoint and then looking for evidence in the biology. Uh, so I think that's what happened. Um, but you know, should yeah, I think speak about that? But anyway, that, that's my guess at what happened here. But anyway, so he showed this stuff um, uh, completely computationally and then they actually verified this stuff uh, in biology. And so from the biological standpoint, what's going on with this neuron is you have this complex um, you know, dendritic tree um, in the very, very close to the cell body, the synapses are essentially doing the point neuron thing that they're taking a weighted sum. It's a, a linear summation of the inputs. And if you get enough inputs, the cell will fire. So this is kind of the classic point neuron model. Because those synapses and, are close to, back to why there's no excitatory synapses on the soma itself. But those in the blue area, green area are close enough that they act as if there is no uh, impedance mismatch between them and the cell body. Yeah. So you can different. think of them almost as being some of the soma. Yeah. And you know, here it says 10% of synapses, but it's actually a much smaller percentage mm -hmm. than that. Yeah, it's not as varied kind of a Yeah. <laughs> um, and most of this, the vast majority of the synapses are on these uh, you know, more distal, or distal means further away from the cell body. So more distal uh, segments. And these are the ones that are pattern detectors. Uh, there, that's where you know here I'm saying eight to fifteen coactive co-located synapses can generate dendritic and MDA spikes, and I'll show that in a, in a second. So basically, you detect very very sparse small patterns in these uh, dendritic segments, and this leads to something called a sustained depolarization of the soma, and I'll show that in a, in a second as well. I and the key. Do my team in. No, go ahead. But I will describe that a little more. Okay, I was going to say before you get there, one of the first things they notice is that if you activate synapses on these outside of the green circle there, you, it's a very, very small effect at the soma. In fact, if you activate a whole bunch of synapses randomly distributed around the cell, it's not enough to make the cell fire. So it's like people say, well, what could these things be doing? I can't, I can't make the cell fire by activating these distal synapses. So that's one of the reasons they ignore them, because yeah. they didn't seem to be doing much. Yeah, so this, uh, this note here doesn't really generate an actual potential. So they would ignore all this stuff, um, but um, here's an example of the type of experimental evidence you see. There's tons of it now since, the, since Bartlett's paper. Uh, here we're looking at a tiny segment of the dendrites, and each dot here represents some synapse that they're actually activating experimentally. And what spines is just, you can just think of it as a synapse here. Uh, and if you, you can see this nonlinearity that if you activate a small number of uh, synapses or weights um, you know, simultaneously, you get some impact. But if you, beyond a certain point, you get this very large impact. So seven gives you a smaller impact and eight gives you a really large impact. So it's almost like a threshold or a sharp signal at that point where- This is measured at the soma. Right, at the, at the bottom. This is measured at the, at the soma. Yeah. Yeah. And pointing out that's never enough to generate a spike at the soma. 
yeah, this is about a five millivolt difference. So it's still relatively small. I think you need like, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 millivolts to actually generate an action potential. Um, so there's tons of evidence uh, for this now, but the point you're on again is just looking at, you know, this less than 10% of the synapses. Let's say it's like two, 3% of the synapses. So like, like all of the computational modeling that's going on uh, in about the neocortex that basically uses point neuron models only looks at like 2% of the synapses. It's ignoring like 99 or 98% of the synapses in the, in the neocortex, which is remarkable. Uh, it's a huge, it's like a black hole in theoretical neuroscience. There's a lot of science. That's right. There are very few people that really model this stuff. There's a little more recently, but very few people that. that um, Quick question. Um, yeah. is, is there a reason why the, the synapses that are, that are so far from the soma, the reason they can't actually make it spike because um, the electric current is lost? As the, as it yeah, travels? basically it's lost. It, it leakages along the, the dendrites, these are leaky uh, pipes, if you will. And there also, there's a lot of uh, a loss at the junction of the, where the synapses split. So there's like an impedance mismatch between you know, two dendrite branches coming together. Uh, yeah. And it's, they're like leaky, you know, it's like leaky pipes. So you put a little pressure in at the end of the pipe and it's all leaking out by the time you get this one. Um. Yeah, and, and if you were to activate just a single one, you would like not even notice anything. It'd be just like this little thing. Sometimes like you'll see a little bit. Yeah, you yeah. see a tiny little one, bit. One. But if you get a cluster of these things activating simultaneously, which is you know, what you get with sparse codes and sparse representations, a bunch of them coming together, like eight or 10 of them, then you get this nonlinear event that happens that generates this uh, potential, increase in the potential. So then uh, Bartlett and... Um, You're gonna talk about the dendritic spike more or not? Yeah, oh, uh, a, little bit. Uh, a little bit more uh, in a second. But this is how Bartlett and um, Yoda Poirazi modeled it. Um, they basically looked at this and said, okay, each dendritic segment is doing a, a linear weighted sum followed by a sigmoid. And then the, sum, the cell body is doing, summing all these up and doing another sigmoid. And so basically it's just like a two layer model. So they said it's, you can look at a neuron and say it's basically a two-layer receptor on a two-layer uh, deep learning system and it's equivalent. Um, so this paper had a huge impact as well on the neuroscience community. I would say it has very little impact on the machine learning community because if you look at this, it's interesting to, that the neuron is now more complex than you might've thought, but from a machine learning standpoint, there's, there's not much use for this. There's, you can't really do much with this. Uh, it's, I mean, it, not, not that you can't do much with it. It's, um, you just have a slightly bigger network and you get all of the properties. So there's no reason to model that. This had a huge effect on the neuron computer community. Yeah. Community, because they felt like, well, I don't have to worry about dendrites because it's just more just more neurons. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and the computational neuroscience community has a huge impact on and the biology. The, the neuroscience community in general, it changes your notion of what a neuron is. But from a machine learning standpoint, it's just a slightly bigger network. It just doesn't really change it. Why go through the complexity of modeling all this when you could just have a slightly bigger network? And, um, and so I, that's one of the reasons I think this is not really caught on with the, with the deep learning community. Um, anyway, but they, they had a huge impact uh, on it at all. Um, uh, that's not really true. So just Tell that that model is not really accurate. Yeah, and, and so that model I think misses some of the uh, some other big properties of it. And one of the big things is this sort of plateau potential. And I've taken this um, diagram from a more recent paper, but this was one of the things that were behind the neuron model that we published. And I'll show that in a bit. But this biological result is is the following: that if you have a clustered set of inputs in these distal dendritic segments. The impact on the cell body is you get this very, very long sustained depolarization or sustained state uh, of the cell body. So this diagram shows that, um, you know, if you have these clustered segments, you get an NMDA spike or, and this, you get this big long um, depolarization at the cell body where it's, it's sort of like in an upstate. It's depolarized by, you know, somewhere five, here they're showing the 20 millivolt 
uh, thing, it could be somewhere around five to 20 millivolts. And this lasts for hundreds of milliseconds, so as long as like half a second. Um, and this basically allows, pushes the cell body closer towards having an action potential. So now when you have inputs coming in, they're gonna respond faster and they're gonna respond uh, more strongly than, than you would otherwise. Okay, so this is this uh, sustained depolarization, plateau potential, those kind of terms that you might see in some of the work we've done. So the basic idea here is that clustered input on dendrites leads to this sustained depolarization at soma. It modulates the neuron, it puts it into this up state, which makes the neuron more likely to fire. So if you have a set of inputs that normally would not make it fire, and we're showing that kind of here, not exactly, but it's similar. The same, uh, same set of inputs now will make the neuron fire. And the neurons in the up state are, respond faster to inputs than they would otherwise. Um, and these neurons are therefore more likely to win you know, any subsequent winner take all computation. I think itself. those last two points uh, were in our neuron paper. I don't know if they were ever talked about before. Um, um, that was, I think it was speculation on our part. Yeah, I've, I've seen it sort of at least, I, I know they mentioned in this 2018 paper. I haven't seen it in biology before that. Well, in our, we, in our, we, we talked about it. But yeah, in, uh, we, we first came up with this in 2010 or something. Yeah. Right? Um, so, I mean, that was a speculation on our part. Um, it was a novel idea was that, that neurons in these other, our temporal memory required this, that the neurons fight sooner than they would otherwise. This was not known. And that was sufficient to be a competitive competition. Yeah. Um, which is also, it's a very short period of time. And so it wasn't even clear that was enough time to win a competition. <laughs> yeah. So we had to verify both those things. Yeah, th those things weren't known, but um, I have this diagram from, this is some, uh, we had a visit from a neuroscientist called Wayne and Son, who's really into this stuff. And he got very excited about our theory. I don't know if you remember this, but after visiting with us, he went back to his lab and actually tested this out. Um, <laughs> There's a fun story. I hope it's the, this is maybe public. I hope Wayne doesn't mind this. No, I, I've sh shared this publicly with his. Uh, well, the story about how I met him. Uh, I don't know about the story. I was at the, I was at a, a conference in San Jose, and he was in he was working in Oregon, and I'm sitting in this audience, this big conference room, and. Um, and he sits down next to me and he goes, oh, oh Joe Hawkins, oh, nice to meet you. And then he, then he revealed to me, he flew down from Oregon just to find him, <laughs> to sit next to me in this conference. <laughs> so he read this paper, our, our neuron paper, and he was so excited about it. He goes, I can't believe this. You guys, you know, this is amazing. So then that's how we got to meet him. <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's, he's a very energetic, really fun person to talk to. He's very knowledgeable about this stuff. He came to our lab and, and after something, and, yeah. and then yeah. talked about it. Then went back to his lab and tested this idea out. That uh, and basically what this shows here is um, he was doing this on real neurons um, from rat barrel cortex, and but this was in slices. You can control the timings of these pulses very precisely. So the red. Uh, this blue, I think it's a, no, this black line here shows what would happen normally. Like you have no plateau potential and then you stimulate the cell and it, and you know, the yeah. stimulation is integrated into the cell body and then eventually you get an action potential. And with the exact same, now if you, if you depolarize the cell body to simulate a plateau potential and do the exact same stimulation, there's a five millisecond difference in these experiments so despite the neuron spikes five milliseconds earlier than it would otherwise. So this was very reliable in this experiment. But again, I don't know this has really been in a published paper yet. Um, I know he did this, uh, but I haven't really seen this. There, might, there must be, someone must have done this. Um, but this five milliseconds, if you have very fast inhibitory networks, which do exist, um, then that's enough to uh, make this neuron win. So what has to happen here, this cell has to spike, it has to then activate an inhibitory neuron, get the inhibitory neuron to spike, and that inhibitory neuron has to then um, um, project to other excitatory neurons and prevent them from spiking. Yeah. All that has to happen in five milliseconds, um, which was a question in the theory. 
could, yeah. is that sufficient? But we do believe it. Yeah, and I've asked a bunch of neuroscientists who study this, these circuits, and they say it's, it's just barely fast enough. They think it is fast yeah. enough because these inhibitory neurons are super fast. They're really fast. Uh, um, and so, but, you know, so multiple neurons get this input simultaneously, then the one that's depolarized will inhibit the other ones. Uh, that's the kind of the, our theory. Is it the case that you know about um, activity on the distal dendrites can generate a action potential unless there is something at the basal? No, no. I mean, I mean you can artificially stimulate hundreds of these inputs right. all over the place, and then, and then eventually get it to spike. Yeah, but yeah. but in but, natural, uh, in, in natural reality, network, would, no. It's okay. generally believed that's not. It's not believed to happen. Okay. There's been some really elegant experiments where they do activate synapses at multiple sites along um, the dendritic branches, and it doesn't even come close to generating action potential. Uh, but if you take the same number of synapses and you put them on one branch, then it's uh, a dead, at least of the depolarization. Uh, and at the outside, if you're distributed around, how they have any effect. Yeah. It just it, doesn't have much of an effect. It, it is possible that if you get bunch of these clustered things in different parts of the junior garbage simultaneously again which will probably be very unlikely you get multiple nmda spikes a, a, a neuroscientists that, that i've spoken to think that is possible to cause an action potential but they don't no one's kind of seen that uh it's an important question in some sense because we've talked about this idea of these active predictions where you, maybe context alone can cause things to fire um so yeah, but we haven't really directed all of that. Yeah. There's still some confusion around that, I think. Anyway, so that's, so basically you get this clustered inputs you, in these active dendrites, it leads to this sustained depolarization, and then that can cause these neurons to respond faster and win and, and become part of the sparse code that happens later. So that led, that's sort of the, I shouldn't say that led to it. <laughs> this, 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 paper, this paper is after our paper, but that the, those ideas were the basis for our sequence memory, which Jeff first talked about 2009 or 2010. Yeah, right. um, so we call it FDR at that point. <laughs> 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 anyway, um, it's a sequence memory. This is what we call our neuron paper, if you've heard that. Uh, Thing. So this was in 2016. Um, so I'll walk through kind of the basic idea there. Um, and kind of Jeff made this observation, I think in non-intelligence actually, um, maybe even, yeah. well, actually even before in your yeah. Berkeley paper. Yeah, I did back in uh, the, the 80s, 86. And very similar to kind of ideas of predictive coding and other things like that, is that the neural cortex is constantly predicting its input. Um, and I guess you found this quote from 1951, Lashley, who was Hebb's supervisor, I think, thesis supervisor, um, saying the prediction is the most important and the most neglected problem of cerebral physiology. Um, and so basically what we propose in that paper is that uh, neurons are actually constantly predicting their inputs based on these contextual uh, ideas. Uh, so. Um, this, so this led to this idea of the HTM neuron model. Um, and this diagram on the left shows how we model the complexity of a pyramidal neuron here. So the idea is there is this proximal segment, which is uh, the typical inputs, which are in this linear weighted sum. Then you have a bunch of independent distal dendritic segments that are getting contextual input. Um, and each one of those you get a, a, a sum of them followed by a threshold or a nonlinearity. Um, and these would depolarize the cell body. And then in the apical areas here, we have another set of uh, contextual signals, feedback signals, or other signals that also impact the cell body. So I'm not actually going to talk too much about this. Uh, we can do that at a later meeting. There's separate kind of interesting phenomena that happen with the apical dendrites, but mostly what These are all ex, uh, excitatory. These are all excitatory. Excitatory, yeah. Um, so the basic idea is that these proximal synapses that we usually show in green are just, you know, feed forward inputs. They're the ones that actually cause the spikes 
they define the classic receptive field of the neuron. Um, the distal synapses cause dendritic spikes, and they put the cell into a depolarized state, what we call a predictive state. And when you de de detect context, it's actually predicting um, uh, the input that's going to come next. Um, so the kind of so, so basically, this is worth punching. When a cell fires through to the green input, it tries to find other neurons that would have predicted that it should have been active. So it's basically forming synapses to other axons, other neurons that would have could have, that were active just prior to that. And say, oh well, maybe these neurons predict my they, they were predictive. So that's what's learning in the in the, in the context block there. It's just trying to it's, it's very simple. This is I'm going to try to find a pattern of activity that predicted my own becoming active. Yeah, and I'll talk about that in just oh, a second. Okay, the learning rules, but that's the way. That's the basic idea. It's a cell is constantly trying to predict its input and will try to find contextual patterns which will allow it to win um, because the context predicted its input. Um, it's a little bit redundant, but basically, uh, you know, clustered inputs on dendrites detect sparse contextual patterns that cause this depolarization. These cells fire sooner and inhibit nearby neurons, and the neuron is thus predicting its activity in hundreds of unique contexts. Um, these concepts are very much core to our, our kind of dendritic work even, even today. So these are the learning rules that uh, Jeff talked about. Um, and basically what we're saying is that whenever cell becomes active, suppose there was no prediction, this is this number two here, then it will try to grow connection by subsampling cells that were active in the past. Um, and that thereby the cell will be more likely to then predict it's in, become active if you get this contextual activity again. Um, if there was a prediction, then we just reinforce that segment. We just uh, increase the, the, I'll just call them weights, <laughs> the inputs that cause that activity and decrease the weights of the uh, inputs that didn't come, that were not active. Um, if this, if however, uh, the neuron was, is not active, uh, if there was a prediction, if, the, if there was an NNDA spike, then it could be a mistaken prediction. In that case, we weaken the segment, so it's less likely to, to do that. So these were the base, three basic rules that we had in our uh, HDM model. Um, and you know, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but there's actually detailed biological evidence for each of these things uh, that I've kind of found over the years. Um, um, we didn't know about these when we came up with these learning rules. These were kind of required to get our model to work, um, but they actually correspond very closely to um, something called, called branch-specific plasticity, which is a very localized learning rule. So these are all unsupervised learning rules. They're all local to the neuron, um, um, and they all kind of, this kind of form the basis for, if you will, for the, the learning rules that we have. I think it's worth mentioning this you know, I'm running up against this all the time when people say, well, how do you know these things? You didn't have any biological evidence for this, you know, that kind of stuff. And this shows the, the power of good theoretical thinking. Good theoretical thinking, which is constrained in some sense by biology, in a sense by biology, can, can lead to these predictions and confidence that, that these things are actually happening, even though you did, at the time we came up with, we don't actually have all the data for it. Um, and there's a lot of neuroscientists who are very uncomfortable with that. They yeah. just don't like the idea that you you say something is happening even though you didn't measure it. Uh, but we can say pretty confidently that from a theory point of view, we can strain by biology that these things must be happening. And, and since in neuroscience, there aren't a lot of theorists that do this kind of work. But yeah. it, this shows that it, it really does work. I'll give you an interesting kind of side story on that. Um, this one, I'm forgetting the neuroscientist's name. I'm, uh, he's really famous. He did the original ferret experiment. Oh, um, uh, Mianka Sora, I think. Uh, yeah. I think that's his name. Um, his lab found this uh, this particular evidence that you know if you have if you have a uh, cluster of synapses that become active, the inactive synapses that are nearby actually weaken. They become depressed and. They were pretty excited by this, and he didn't have a theoretical reason for this. Uh, but he's, and I happened to be sitting next to him at this dendrites conference, and I said, "Oh, I know exactly what that is. <laughs> so, it's to reduce the noise and uh, and make it more predictive." And he was super interested in this, and this is 
Um, so that's an example of, uh, and I've been looking for the biological basis for some of this and he had found it. Um, so that was, that was a pretty cool interaction. I don't know if you remember some of this, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was an interesting kind of lunch uh, discussion that we had. Okay, so these are the learning rules. Very, th there's a whole bunch of them. At the end of the day, it's, it's fairly simple. Um, but anyway, yeah. so we kind of put this together to do our sequence memory in the 2016 paper. Uh, there's a lot to parse here, but basically, um, neurons are arranged in these mini columns where all of the cells in the mini columns um, detect the same feed forward input pattern. They have the same receptive field. And again, this is a biological fact as well. And it's what we just be careful, it's not all the cells in the mini column, but a subset of cells in each mini column have the same receptor. Yeah, maybe, maybe within a layer. Even within a layer. Yeah. Uh, um, and so they detect the same pattern. And what we said is, well, suppose they got lateral input from all of the other cells nearby, and those lateral inputs were on the distal dendritic segments, which is also something you see that, and that you see that in the anatomy as well. Um, so these active dendritic segments will form connections to the nearby cells. And then when, whenever you have a depolarized cell, it's gonna fire first within the mini column and inhibit the other cells in the mini column. If you had those properties plus the learning goal that we had, you can actually get a very, very powerful sequence memory. And so basically it works something like this. Uh, here's a example where you have a layer of cells and there's no predictions, there's no depolarized states in there. When you get some feed forward input, all of the cells in the mini column will become active because no one's inhibiting anyone else. Um, they all fire at the same time. So you get this sort of burst of activity. Um, but if you did have predictive input, so let's say these little red cells here at time t equals zero were depolarized, so they're predicting their input. When you do get the input, um, these depolarized cells will inhibit the other cells in the mini column and you'll, you'll get this very, very sparse code that uh, represents this prediction in the context of the prior input. Yeah. Again, I'm not going to go into uh, in too much detail here, but that, this was kind of the basis for our sequence memory. And then, uh, yeah, and then these cells in turn will cause a future prediction. So they are going to depolarize other cells within that layer that will form the prediction for the next. Uh, and we showed in a bunch of Work that this can lead to really powerful properties. Again, it's like a bullet. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's a powerful continuity learning sequence memory. Uh, it, in, when you give it streaming data, it can, uh, it can learn to pick up on patterns in that streaming data. It can actually pick up some of the higher order um, temporal patterns, which is you can look at, it automatically learns to pick up context that was far back in time. That is predictive of the current input. So it's called high order. order. So on, a, a large motivation for this is to think about the picture on the left. You got a that shows five mini columns being active. That represents your input. Those mini columns represent your input. It says these seven mini columns represent the current thing I'm sensing. But then you want to be able to represent that input in many different contexts, right? So it's, it's the same input, those five mini columns, but in different contexts. So Picture on the right says, yeah, it's the same input, those same five mini columns are active, but now I'm doing this picking individual cells in each one. So that you can think of it as that's, I used to think of it as like the melody. The, the mini columns represents the note in the melody, but you have to have a unique representation for that note in all possible melodies. Therefore, the, the one on the right says that's that note at this location in this particular melody. And if you think about that, you have to have that kind of representation everywhere in the brain. So this is like a fundamental idea that you have to have unique representations of inputs in different contexts. Mm -hmm. And you do the math on this, and it turns out there's a very large number of contexts you can represent the same input. And we can go over this in more detail in a future research meeting, because uh, we have a lot of new people here. Um, you know, another way to think about this is that the, the context is invoking a very, very specific subnetwork within this population of cells. So this, um, you know, this set of black dots is a subnetwork um, that's activated that represents this particular context. It's very, very specific to that context. Um, and this is actually a 
So we use this for sequence memory, but the basic idea can be actually used in, in lots of different ways. Um, so in our columns paper, we use the exact same code, the exact same logic, the exact same learning rules, everything to represent um, uh, sensory input in the context of allocentric location. So here as a picture from, from that paper or from a talk on that paper that uh, this lower layer of cells is exactly the same thing I showed before, but instead of getting context from other cells near in the same layer, it's getting a context signal that's representing location. That's an allocentric location signal. And when you have that, um, again, with the exact same code, um, you are now representing uh, sensory features that are specific to, specific to particular locations on, a, on the reference frame that's on that object. Uh, so this is a way you can represent um, you know, the sensory portion of, of reference frames. So as you move, um, you would predict the location that you're about to touch, and this would predict the sensory inputs you're about to receive, and then you invoke that particular subset. Yeah, so using allocentric location, so the layers can accurately predict its input as a sensor. And this is, again, it just shows the power of this dendritic computation. The exact same stuff with a very different context signal can lead to another sort of powerful capability. So there, it's a very flexible way of doing context integration. We never showed this, but if, if it turns out that you actually went through the same set of motions each time, like if you're doing a movement, but if I learn to move my finger in a certain way relative to an object, then you learn it as a sequence too, right? Yeah. It, it, the, the same network can learn both like a motor sensory uh, context and a sequence context. Um, so it's not like you have to have one or the other. You can have both. It'll just say whatever is predictive, that's what I'm going to learn. So I always use the example of drying yourself off with a towel after taking a shower. You tend to do it in the exact same sequence every time. You don't really realize that if you observe yourself. Um, so it, it didn't start that way, but if you start doing it that way, then you'll learn it as a sequence. Um, again, there's a lot of experimental evidence behind it going back to the, this is a partial <laughs> list actually, and, and there's also a lot of testable predictions uh, that come out. And, and you know, when I show this in neuroscience conferences, they get pretty excited about this. And I think there continues to be people you know, trying to test out different this is up, and I've already shown you some other stuff that came out after our, our paper came out. Um, so just a quick summary. Uh, real neurons are not simple point neurons. Uh, synapses on active dendrites detect dozens of sparse contextual patterns. Sustained depolarization at Zoma leads to faster firing, and there's, there's a diverse set of local unsupervised learning rules that uh, are also there in biology. And then when you start modeling this, uh, basically dendrites enable a very flexible context integration capability in layers of neurons. So talked about the idea of a predictive neuron with active neurons, active dendrites and fast inventory networks. It can learn complex temporal sequences. Um, that was our 2016 paper. It can learn sensory motor patterns with a location signal. Um, it's actually also the basis for implementing voting between columns. We use a um, very similar learning rules and very similar ideas to do voting. And I can talk about that in a, in a future meeting. Um, it's also the, these ideas are the basis for implementing dead rights in deep learning that we're working uh, now. Um, and this picture is from a, the paper that I just released with Cal Hall that just shows, again, that you can take the same layer of cells. You can, there's many, many different ways of feeding in context um, and you can get all of these uh, capabilities. So, you know, top-down feedback is kind of thought of as just another type of uh, contextual. Okay, so I know I've covered a lot of stuff there, but hopefully this gives some idea of how we're thinking about dendrites and why we think dendrites are really kind of powerful um, things that can uh, you know, powerful, have powerful functionality that can really impact uh, the functionality of cells and lead to pretty cool capabilities. Okay, that's it. Uh, thanks a million for doing this, Sugitai. I know it was like um, you said, you kind of threw these together last minute, but I thought this was a really clear presentation and this was a ton of help for me. I was tracking like right along with you. Uh,
throughout it. So yeah, this was awesome. Yeah, thanks. I've tried to hopefully bridge some of the language as well and terminology. Um, I don't know if I was successful in that, but these, these concepts are sometimes pretty hard for machine. The biology of it's pretty hard for machine learning people to sometimes understand. Um, but I think over time, these concepts should be integrated into, into deep learning. And then, you know, in future meetings, we'll talk about how we're doing it in, in the deep learning context. We have a long way to go to get biologists to accept this too. Yeah. <laughs> there, are, there are some who are very excited about it, we've mentioned, but there's others who just are clueless about any of this stuff. And um, so it hasn't become sort of like a universal idea, like the point in our, um, I think it will be at some point in time. I, I hope it's in our lifetimes. <laughs> um, but it's a fundamental rethinking of what neurons do in some ways. Um, yeah. And it, it's hard to find a single neuroscience paper that really captures this, uh, this sort of stuff, the way we're talking about it. I think our neuron paper is, is pretty well cited now. I don't know what it's up to, but um, so, you know, it's something. It works. Yeah. yeah. And, and a lot of neuroscientists know about it. When I, people are studying this, when I talk to them, they, they know about our work. It's been yeah. impactful. Oh, that's good. Even though they sometimes forget to cite our paper. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I like about what you were saying is that, it, you know, some early stages, they were ignoring certain parts of the neuron. And to, to me, there's, you know, function follows form. So if there's a part of a structure that you don't understand, you don't ignore it. It's, you know, for a long time, we ignored junk DNA yeah, yeah, yeah. until, yeah. oh, okay, this, oh, micro, oh, God, all the stuff mm -hmm. that's, that's in there. So, you know, something that actually says, okay, here's a reason for the morphology. And maybe there's a reason why there's so many morphological permutations of neurons, yeah, you know, as as well. Why why are there you know thirty different types of you know astrocytes or whatever? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that really gets to the core of what are the title of our yeah. paper. Yeah. Like, why that? Why are there these thousands? It's, it's, it's interesting. interesting. I went back and read this this uh, like paper I wrote when I was a graduate student at Berkeley. It was just like a it's just like a quick paper. Well, it took a while, right? But it was like describing what I wanted to do for my thesis. You can read it. And um, yeah, I'm kind of naive back then, but I this very question was already in my head back then. I was like, well, did you have to explain why all these synapses are there? How can we ignore what all these synapses are doing? Or, you know, and even the genesis of this theory was in that paper where I was arguing that the that the synapses on these dendrites were somehow blowing the threshold or something. But it just struck me that same thing. I mean, it struck me. Oh my god! Like 90% of the synapses are just people that don't have a theory for them. I can't be just you know. It, what, the way science, neuroscientists would describe it, they would say like, well, it modifies the action of the neuron. Well, that's true, but what does that mean? You know, <laughs> you know modulatory effects. What the hell is that? You know, what, why? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is the modulatory effect and how does it work? And you have to understand in the, in the context of a circuit um, to understand that. Yeah, and, and it's striking to me, and this is just a small list of how much biological evidence there is for this stuff that is completely ignored by even computational neuroscience community. It's just like completely ignored. Um, and it's just striking to me. Uh, I, I don't really understand it because uh, the whole idea behind <laughs> computational neuroscience is to model the neuroscience. So, yeah. and regarding that uh, list, uh, during all, all the presentation, I was thinking you should make uh, um, that lists of testable and, and uh, precise experimental uh, uh, experiments where you would test out the actual biology of what's missing. So have available for or, or communicate with experimental labs on, okay, we make that specific prediction, you could test it using this and this type of experiments. Um, would that be interesting to you? Yeah. Or yeah. diffuse Sheets. that broadly and to whoever wants to tr try it or to, to test it. Uh, I think that was my first thought. And the second thought is the Allen brain actually- well, before, you, before you get to your second thought, I think you know, I've often thought about writing a review paper with something like that, you know, summarizing a lot of this, summarizing the model, 
I just don't have time to do it. <laughs> so if someone, okay. Not like the HTM neuron five years later or something like that. You know? Something like that. But I don't know. But you know, reviewing a lot of this stuff with testable predictions, yeah. we've learned a lot more yeah. since then. And just putting it in, maybe similar to what I just, the way I presented it. Is even, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm getting it to a, be... a high level idea like this. Um, and so I don't know if you want to help me write it. <laughs> sure. I mean, <laughs> it's, I think it's one thing like, Theoretical driven neuroscience is one thing that's really powerful. The, the, the loop between experimental and, and theoretical neuroscience is, is crazy powerful. So yeah, I think this, it's... if you have even one of the experiments of the uh, uh, experiment to propose, and I, right now I see multiple, I think there together. should be, yeah, there should be, there sh it should be either, I don't know, a blog post, a paper in itself, uh, but, uh, but they should not I, I think if we really want to have an impact on neuroscientists, it needs to be a peer-reviewed paper. I agree. Yeah. I agree, um, but that's, that can be done. Um, yeah. I would love to help with that. I can talk to you. I mean, I've actually, we've actually done some of this work with, a, with some neuroscientists. I could even yeah. uh, review this if you want. I don't know. Um, sure. But there are some predictions that come out of the paper that we verified with experimental data with uh, Spencer Smith. Spencer is a well-known um, neuroscientist in the active then right world. Yeah. Once you set up like the whole experimental scheme, uh, I mean, it would be interesting for people to just do it. And on that front, uh, that's my second point is the Allen Institute actually just opened up um, uh, what they call open scope. Uh, it's basically you suggest to them a bunch of experiments to run from a uh, theoretically driven uh, hypothesis, they're gonna run them and then you get the data. Yeah, so I, I've, I've talked to them about it. I've talked to the people okay. who, who run that program um, and they're interested in this sort of stuff. Again, though, it would take a lot of our time because we have to come up with a, you know, as you know, coming up with experimental design is not trivial. Uh, yeah. And then when you get the data and analyzing it and putting it together into a paper is, you know, the whole thing is probably one to two years of work uh, yeah. uh, at the end of it all. Um, and so that's really not something we're able to do right now. Uh, but I agree, it would be great to, this is the kind of thing, you know, we could collaborate with another lab if they want to do this. Um, yeah, so if anyone is perfect. listening to this research meeting and wants to help out with that, we're more than open uh, to that. There's a lot of stuff that could be done. I mean, if we have if people, well, I could talk about this experiment. It's, it's kind of cool. Um, I mean, I'd love to. But... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. um, I don't think I have the movie easily available, unfortunately. I think it's in another presentation. I would have to find it. But basically, um, there's a bunch of predictions that come out of the temporal memory. And Spencer and Yi Yu um, had run some experiments already where they had data that would, where the design was very close to what we might want to test some of these. And so we actually worked with them to get their data and uh, put it and did some analysis on this. And basically what they did was they had a mouse, um, they created this, it's a really fun movie. I wish I had, I can show this in a little bit, but they had a, a movie where they, he basically took a camera into the rat's cage and moved it around as if it was a mouse running around <laughs> in their little nest. Um, and then they basically showed that movie over and over again to a mouse while they were recording from um, V1 and V2 um, in here using optical recording. So they got hundreds of neurons um, uh, that were recording. And the basic idea is that this is a 30 second sequence, a natural sequence that you're seeing over and over and over again. If you remember correctly, the if you remember from previously what I was showing, when you don't have a prediction, what you what you expect to see is a burst of activity, so more dense activity, and then as you learn to make predictions, it should become really sparse the activity. Um, that's the basic kind of prediction, uh, and there's another prediction which I'll talk about in a second. And so basically, that's what they saw um, um, in their in their trials. So. Here, this is the first trial, the first time the mouse sees the sequence. Um, this is a 30 second long sequence. So the x-axis goes from zero to 30 and these are kind of neurons firing. 
So that the first time it sees it, you get this much activity, and the 20th time, you get this really sparse uh, activity here. Um, and the same thing in AL, which is kind of like B2 in the mouse. Um, and here's a plot of the density of the activations uh, as it sees more and more stuff that it goes, becomes very sparse. We're not quite sure what these spikes are, but um, anyway, overall, it becomes very sparse over time. Um, the other even stronger prediction is that when you look at a sequence, some sparse subset of the neurons at one time step is going to predict the activity of the next set of neurons that fire. That there's going to be clusters of cells that fire that predict the next set because that's what's being detected in these active dendrites. And so we actually look for clusters in here as well. Um, so first of all, we find that um, these cell assemblies or these clusters of cells are much, much more likely to occur in these sequences than you would predict um, just by chance. So you do get these uh, clusters of cells that occur. And so these are like clusters of three cells at a time, four cells at a time, five cells at a time, and so on. Um, so the, the likelihood of these clusters occurring at the same point in time is much higher than you would expect randomly. Um, and more importantly, when you look at the sparse code at a particular point in the sequence, uh, when you look at a particular point in the se sequence, you get the same sparse code recurring. Whereas if, if you look at it, any single neuron, the probability of it firing is pretty uniform throughout the sequence. But when you look at a particular point in the movie, you get the same you basically get the same subset of uh, cells that are re repeatedly occurring. So this sparse code is very predictive of that frame in that movie at that point in time, which is a pretty remarkable. Uh, uh, that thing. goes back to what I was saying earlier about the notes and the melody. Right? Yeah, it's just like the notes and the melody. Uh, it's this frame. Uh, what I find remarkable about this is that we, we have to have these unique representations of just an incredible number of things in different contexts. It's just you know, I, th I think getting about the melody example, like, I know hundreds of melodies and they repeat notes, but every single interval in any particular melody has a unique representation, you know, like, <laughs> depending on where it is in the melody. Yeah. Um, and that's just that's a subset of the course. It's never going to be like this. Yeah. Um, what's, what's the meaning of the different colored bars in this um, Well, these are... Um, I think one of them is what would be, if you look at just the average firing rate of the cell and you do a Poisson model of that, what is the probability of an assembly occurring, the specific group of cells occurring. And then the other one I think is we looked at the data and just shuffled everything up and then looked at the likelihood of cells. Okay. So, um, so I see decaying across there is a function order on two of the bars and then ascending on the other Exactly. Bar. So the blue bar is what actually occurs. Um, so the number of unique cell assemblies uh, increased uh, the, yeah, the number that we were able to uh, count. Um, this is sort of six cells at a firing at a time right. um, versus what would be predicted by just a probabilistic model, where as the number of, right. as the order increases, you, it's less and less likely that it's going to occur by chance. So one's Poisson and the other one's... The other one's, I think, the shuffled one, um, which... Uh, again, decreases, but when you look at the actual data, it's a little more likely to occur than the chance because there's a, again, they, they really are, in the unshuffled version, they, they do occur. So even in the shuffled version, you get them. Okay. So but anyway, the, the, the yellow and the blue, I think, are the more important ones. Yeah, so the fact that you're getting an increase, perhaps a leveling off as you get a higher order, that is that saying anything that's just simultaneously activity, or is yeah, it? They're, they're in one time bin, how many were active at a time, and we just looked at the, gave each one a, pos a bit position, and look, that would be a unique code. Can, how you often submit, or, can you make any inference as to the structure of the wide network of that? Or mm -hmm. is that uh, the not, not uh, maybe. Uh, a couple of other people have done, done that, but. Um, this, 
this experiment was not really designed with the sequence memory in mind, so I'm not sure we can get that. And the other thing is this is using calcium spikes, so there's a lot of noise in here. Okay. Um, and it's only looking at a subset of the actual cells that are firing, not all the cells. So there are a lot of complexities. Okay. Um, there was a similar finding in 2014 in, in Eustace lab um, that, that showed a similar thing. They didn't show the top one, but I think they showed the bottom one. Anyway, this is an example of the type of thing, uh, Jeremy, that, that is a type of experiment where you could come up with a very specific experiment with a lot of specific predictions that come out of the, the theory. Would it, is it, would it be useful, you think, at some point to go through and find all the people who signed this paper and you might discover more of these? Yeah, there's... Um, I've never done that. You know, I've never, like, followed all the little papers that cite something. Yeah, there's a really good one, which my memory is so bad. I mean, there's so many papers, there's so many people doing so many things, you can't possibly keep track of it all. And um, I just didn't know that would be useful. Mm -hmm. Well, in this paper, the data was already there. There was no new experiment there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But so, just, just finding, like, you know, how many people are absorbing this and how, who might have tested these ideas. Well, they have the data. Well, in you know, words, they don't have the data. It's been the paper that this paper came out in 2016, even though the white paper was a couple years earlier. So at this point, there's a couple hundred citations or so. And um, and so it might be, I don't know, I've never done it, but it seems like a lot of work. Maybe you find more people who, who've done things related to it that would be helpful. I don't know. I, I just think of, you know, like, you know, as I read in the literature, like new experimental techniques keep cropping on up. And, you know, some of the, some of the, Proposed experiments would be very difficult to do with today's technology, but you know, yeah. add one more technique, and all of a sudden they become accessible. Yeah, so most most experimentalists do not want to be told or what they should test. And um, <laughs> you know, they have been long invested money, time, research, animals, all this incredible difficult stuff to do. It's very difficult work in experimentalists, and. Um, you know that you know, and they're not about to be derailed because hey, I have this idea. You want to test it? Most of them are like screw you. You know, it's like I got my own things. Um, so you, in some sense, the theories have to be well accepted. They have to be sort of in the in our kind of work we do has to be, you know, has to be sort of prevalent already before they'll take any time thinking about testing. You know, um, yeah. They're just just something to be aware of. They're not sitting around going, hey, you know, you go and say, would you like to test this idea? They'll say, what the hell yeah. are you talking about? So this is a good example of, of one of those. Uh, Michael Berry uh, visited us, and he also read our paper. and was pretty excited about it, um, and he did he did cite us as well in here. But uh, they did a similar thing where they showed sequences of, in this case, Gabor patches, and they found a bunch of uh, findings which are completely consistent with the temporal memory um, in here. So it, it's. So this could, this is one of those papers. I think this is the preprint version, but since then, I think it's in science or somewhere. Could you, could you post that onto uh, research papers? Because I mean, I, that something twigged on what you just showed, right? Now. Okay. And this is the same David Tank that oh did the, <laughs> <laughs> did the grid cell stuff that you talked about. Okay. Marcus and Jeff. Yeah. So, but yeah, this could be an example of what you're talking about. One thing that piqued my interest in this presentation was uh, on one of your last slides, you talked about um, uh, past states acting as contextual input. And uh, I know you've studied that type of thing before uh, like through the lens of HTM. And I'm kind of curious in the current Dead Rights Project, um, whether you go previous state as contextual input. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been kind of asking a little bit about the dendrite sprites generally, so I don't think you've looked at like recurrent dendritic networks so far, but what's your thinking about maybe testing that out? Just yeah, and I mean, it's, it's a natural thing to put in. Um, yeah, so the idea was uh, in the, con I think in the context of deep learning, our deep learning work, um, doing recurrent inputs like we had with uh, the sequence memory. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I think that's that that will come for sure. I mean, there's, there's a difficulty in going from the biology to applying it to to machine learning, right? 
And I think that's a clever thing that Subutai came up with a couple of years ago, is the idea that you can do this sort of incrementally, but you don't get all of it, right? You're yeah. just getting pieces of it. Yeah. Because we're trying to not uh, create these biological networks. We're just trying to improve machine learning networks initially. Is that related to that question? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and uh, so the recurrent stuff will could come very easily um, onto this. Um, right now, I think we're focused on showing the impact of this for continual learning in a feed, pure feed-forward network. Um, but it, it's much more natural to do this in the, in the, within the context of our recurrent network and, and you know, temporal inputs, sequence of inputs. So when you look yeah. at some of this, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, I'm sure yours is a better question. Go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Pro I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Vivian. Um, yeah, uh, do you have any like data or experiments on how the generalization capabilities are of this? So, does the prediction mostly rely on memory and sequences that were observed in the past? Or can you also extrapolate to new sequences that kind of follow the same pattern? Or like, for example, every sentence ends with a period and I can see a completely new sentence that I never read before, but I'm still not surprised by a period coming in the end, for instance. Yeah, so we've talked about it in, in the context of the location input. So if you have, if you're sensing stuff uh, and you know the location of this uh, on the object that you're, you're sensing, you can make a prediction of the inputs and with grid cells and with this memory, the exact sequence of your movements doesn't matter at all. Um, as long as you can predict the right context, you can uh, predict the sensory input. Um, and so you could, you could do that with, with grid cells. And this is something that you can't really do easily in a recurrent neural network in an artificial network because they tend to um, fixate on the memorized specific sequences as opposed to doing this kind of path integration. And uh, so, this, so that's one example where you know, the sequence, specific sequence of movements uh, doesn't matter. You can still make a prediction on, on the input. I, I, uh, we haven't really done too much in the broad generalization yeah. uh, stuff, although we talked about it in the past. I think the way the sequence memory was presented, it, it doesn't do any generalization at all. Um, and we kind of recognize that as the limit of it. Uh, and and I, what we have, what, what we do know is that we've come out on this, and we haven't really published this or really worked on much, but in the context of sensory motor in learning with a location signal, what we believe is going on is if you see something novel, um, that what what you, you clue in on subsets of the of the sequence, whether it's the, the direct sequence or if it's a sensory motor sequence, or it's sort of like when I look at a new object and I don't know what it is, I look for subsets of it that have a familiar arrangement relative to each other. And then I generalize from the subset. It's like if I hear a new melody, but, um, but it has some similarities to previous melodies, I won't be able to predict every note. But in some subset of that melody, I'll be able to predict the next note because it's in a certain genre or certain it's familiar to other motifs I've heard. In the same way that if I'm looking at some physical object and I'm manipulating it or touching it, if some subset of the components that I, in some subsequence of it, are similar, then I make predictions based on that. So I think that's the general gist of, of generalization is that we're relying on relationships that we've seen before of a subset of the whole thing we're looking at, and, and we, we generalize from that. But we've never really explored that, I believe, in any kind of our research here. Okay. So let me just rephrase it so I sure that I understood it right. So I guess there are different types of generalization. So for instance, if I uh, see a new object that is kind of similar to an object I've seen before, I can sort it into that same category because uh, similar mini columns will be activated, but not exactly the same ones, uh, but similar ones. And if it's a similar context, it would be the same with the context vector that it's not an exact match, but it's kind of a Good enough, well, it's, it's, it's more that there's a subset of the object I'm observing, whether it's a melody or a physical object. There's a subset of it that has a, a, a consistent relationship that I've observed before, and so I can make predictions from that. It would be the same mini columns, and um, 
and initially it would be like uh, I would even be sort of invoking the same, maybe even some of the same cells in those mini columns. It's like, oh yeah, this is now I'm starting to recognize this thing. Um, um, but, but, you know, the same note or the same feature that you observe is going to represent, be represented by the same sort of mini columns. Um, it's the unique cells in those mini columns that are that are representing that in some context. I don't know how to describe it. I just wanted to correct that. I think it's the same. It, it generally, the idea would be the same mini columns that are actually invoked. Um, it's the unique cells that, that we're trying to deal with here. I hope that helps at all. Okay. okay. And um, do you have any, I don't know, do you have an option of having like a hierarchy in there? So for instance, if we think of this sentence example, every sentence ends with a period, and maybe I know this because I know the set general sentence structure of noun, verb, and so on. And I recognize this uh, sentence structure, even though I haven't seen these exact words in this order, that it, this is like a higher order type of sequence. That I'm yeah, we, don't, we don't understand that uh, okay. well at all. Uh, so the whole idea of hierarchy in these systems is it's gotten more confusing in some sense to me than less confusing. So that's a great question, Vivian, but I have no idea at the moment how to explain it. Yeah, the trick is, I mean, it's like the classic view of hierarchy, which you kind of understand that view, but it's not consistent with a lot of the biological evidence. Uh, so it's become more confusing over time. I'm hoping that as we develop more in the details of the cortical column theory, um, that Marcus and I are working on right now, um, that we'll get insights to better understand hierarchy. Uh, so we're not focusing on it right now. It's, it's, it's kind of, it's just, it's too many things to think about at once. So, um, but as we get a better idea of the actual representations that are occurring in cortical columns um, and the processes that are going on in there, then, then we can say, oh, what do these outputs represent and how can I, how can I hook them together in different ways in different columns and different ways, some hierarchical, some, some not. And uh, but at the moment, we're not doing that. Lawrence? Yeah, mine's not as good. As it <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, when you've done some of this analysis with, you know, HKMs and things like this, and you've done some of these experiments, did you try to compare it to sort of classical deep learning, you know, how would you solve the same problem? And, you know, what was the sort of accuracy, accuracy robustness and sort of you computational talking about, spend? You're talking about the, the machine learning implementation, yeah. not, not the biology. Not the biology. I mean, essentially, right, there's a classic, you know, if you're thinking about sequence learning, if you think about sequence prediction and stuff, there are classic non-biologically inspired you know, ways of doing this, right? And so I was just wondering how those two contrast it, right? You know, HTMs versus this, you know, is it, Robustness is a neuron saving, you know, those those kind of questions. We yeah, that. we did some, yeah, I can talk about well, that. We That's a very good question. Oh, well, oh. We, did <laughs> we did do a bunch of that. Yeah. yeah. We did I would say there's two sets of things we've done with that. Uh let's see if I can find it. Well, I was sometimes looking for this. I want to make two buckets of thoughts about this. One is, you know, the biology is the biology. And one of our goals is to understand the biology. Yeah. The biology doesn't have to be better yeah, yeah. than, you know. I don't think the biology is ever going to be good at you know certain thing tasks that machine learning. Like my biology is never going to be good as my calculator, right? Yeah, yeah. So the biology doesn't care about being better. The biology cares about being right. What is going on in our brain, and, and we're going to try to get insights from that. But then when you build something practical, then you might care about that. Yep. And so when we were doing like the Grok phase of the Numenta, um, you know, then we had to really worry about these kind of things. Oh, how good is this algorithm at? at, 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 at you know, you know, uh, anomaly detection, because there's other algorithms that are yeah. anomaly detection, they might be better. Um, but uh, we never want to be distracted to think like, well, something is better at this task, therefore we can abandon the biology. No, we don't want to do that until we understand the biology completely, then you can, then you can back off from it. So then we start to optimize the brain. Uh, well, oh, yeah. Yeah. Brain 2.0. I mean, yes. you, know, <laughs> you and I are totally <laughs> It's very tempting. It's very tempting to say, well, this this non biological system or quote, biological inspired system works better. So why should we think about the biology? Yeah. Um, that that is not what we want to do here at the you, you you have to be cognizant of that, 
But if you take that approach, then you would have never discovered the sensory motor learning. You would never discover this stuff I'm talking about the thalamus. You never discover the stuff Marcus is doing with the, you know, the details of how we're going to do this this uh, this graph structure. So it's 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 kind of balanced between these two. Yeah. So yeah. So this is one of the papers we we published on this, um, uh, and this compared our sequence memory to LSTMs. All right. Um, yeah, yeah. This was uh, a couple of years ago. I forget when exactly, but I'm so glad you realize I I don't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I don't remember these things. I don't remember any of this stuff. It's really like, oh my god, we did all this stuff. Yeah, this was in neural computation, um, and kind of like what Jeff was saying. You know, where the focus is not just yeah, accuracy. Yeah. So that's typically what's measured in, in deep learning. But we showed you as with complex temporal sequences. Um, we can get the same accuracy as LSTMs, but the the HTM model was much better at responding to changes in the input. Uh, so it's because you learning, yeah. 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 Right. And, and robustness yeah, yeah. as well. So we when the when the when if there's some change in the statistics of the input, then the HTM model responds very, very quickly to it. Whereas the LSTM takes a long time because it's essentially a batch based yeah. system. Any change in the in the statistics in the beginning will be just error, and so it gets averaged out, and it has to become a big part of the batch before you start yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. taking into account. Whereas our system is you know well, this, 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 this gets the core of one of the advantages of having these dendritic uh, sure. models yeah. is that learning is localized to that dendritic branch, and therefore all kinds of learning can occur without messing up everything else. Yeah. And it requires on all these things because you have a sparse distributed representation that's a multiple dendrite per you know per cell. But if you add all that up, you basically get this very, very fast learning system theory. Uh, and I, I assume you guys are making that happen now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it was actually even then the HDM memory was way faster than the LSTM. The LSTM had to keep retraining it on the on the stuff, um, you know, multiple iterations where this was just one pass through the system. Just like humans, you know, it's just one pass through the, the data. It was super fast as well. So that's another benefit. Could you send that a point to that paper as well? Yeah. Yeah. These are all on our website too. Yeah, you can go to nementa.com slash papers. That was not a good question. Yeah, that was not a good question. Library of Congress. Yeah, and this was another paper that um, maybe Jeff doesn't remember. But this was <laughs> anomaly detection paper. This one at least doesn't have his name on it. So. Yeah. Um, but we showed that um, at, from anomaly detection, prediction is just the, you know, if you're making predictions, uh, you can detect when you have anomalies because you have that your predictions are incorrect and there's a burst of activity. So we use that in um, all these real time, but a bunch of real time data from various uh, companies and we labeled it with anomalies and this uh, technique is much, much better at, at anomaly detection than other competing techniques. So there's a whole benchmark that we have around this called NAV. You had to, uh, you had to, you had to label the anomalies, they, it, they didn't just emerge? Well, they did, but how do you What do you mean by emerge? Yeah. Uh, well, the, no, no, HTM never received labeled anomalies, the benchmark. Oh, oh yes, yes. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 that's a good point. In, in order to figure out how well did the, the algorithms do, yeah, yeah. we yeah. had uh, on the side, we had labeled anomalies. But these anomalies were not, not obvious because some of these required experts in the field to label them um, because there were subtle things that would happen and changes that would predict future failures um, that were not couldn't detect with a threshold or something like that. I have an example of that somewhere. Yeah, this is this, this that got first big example. Like this little slight drop in here was when an expert looked at it, they could say, oh yeah, that's a problem with the system. This was like this big industrial machine. This is a temperature sensor. And then here is where the system actually failed. The temperature went way down. Uh, so, but this, this occurrence, like weeks before the, or several days before the actual failure, was predictive of, of this failure. I see. So we, we were able to detect this. And this thing here, this was a planned shutdown of the system. So this is temperature temperature goes to zero, but it's a totally fine. So that's also an anomaly in some sense, but not a problem. 
So you get these really subtle temporal changes uh, that can predict future problems. I'm trying to see why that particular spike amongst all the other ones that are even deeper is the anomaly. Yeah, I think it's just a bunch of readings that were lower. It's like, like these are just temporary spikes down, and that's okay. Okay. But the, I think these this is like a trend. Yeah, this is like if you kind of blur your eyes, you could see that there's a bunch of readings that were unusually low. Yeah. I'm not an expert in this, but that's how I. But the, the algorithm could detect things. Yeah, algorithm things. detected this. So one very subtle things that you wouldn't be able to see. Um, it doesn't mean they're right, but it would detect them. You know. Um, yeah. You think about like a, a, you're listening to this long complex melody, and you get one note wrong, but it yeah. jumps right out at you, right? But, but why? If you just look at the data, you might not know that, right? right. You, have to, you hardly see that. Yeah. I at, if I showed you the score of the music. That one note, wrong note would just jump out of this page and say, "Yeah, this is the wrong note." You'd have to sort of know what's typical sequences in that melody. Or even some things like you swap out a oboe for a piccolo or something like that. That that will yeah. add to the training. Yeah. 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 In, in, in Lawrence, to your point again, there's we kind of listed a bunch of characteristics that anomaly detection systems should have mm -hmm. that are you know to, as a way of comparing against other stuff like. You must be doing things online. You just get the current input and predict the next input. You have to be able to learn continuously without storing the whole screen. Uh, it, um, you must run in a completely unsupervised way. You have to adapt to dynamic environments. Um, you want to detect anomalies very early. So that graph above was an example. Of course, you have to minimize false positives and false negatives. But I mean, if you think about it, the brain works. This is how the brain works. There's no batch system in there. We don't store the entire data set and make multiple passes through it. We just see things once and that's it. Um, I don't think we left any time for another. We're just going to do something. Was it Jeremy? Yeah, yeah, Alex. Alex, sorry, Alex. Yeah, Alex, I think uh, maybe your link should go out as uh, a future meeting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's no problem. This is a good discussion. I wanted to ask a question about distances, actually. Distance between the dendrite and the soma. Oh, okay. um, um, I might be technically incorrect about this, so please correct me. But um, the further the dendrite is away from the soma, the more abstract concepts it starts to process, right? Um, so maybe- What do you mean by that? So you mentioned that the, the basal dendrites are the ones because they're so close to the soma. Any time that they fire, it actually triggers the action potential for the actual soma itself. If you get enough of them that are firing locally, right? Like, like a linear way that's not kind of... right. And the, the the distal ones, even though they might um, they might fire, they don't actually trigger um, the actual action potential. All they do is the they push it closer to the um, push it closer to the firing. threshold. Yeah, right. The, but they do this. I mean, they do this not because. There isn't a graded response the further out you get. It because what's what's happening is the way we model it is that you get a dendritic spike, and that could occur anywhere along the dendrites. See, but I didn't talk about dendritic spikes too much. Not too much, yeah. yeah. So it's it's not like there's this there's this graded response the further we get to the to the soma. It's more like we kind of model it. This isn't 100 percent accurate, but the way we model it is you have the soma, you have the proximal synapses, that's one thing. Then we model all, all the other synaptic, uh, all the other dendrites. If, if, we, if you saw that picture of the HTM neuron, we, ought, we, ought, we model just as a set of coincidence detectors. We don't, have to, we don't pay any attention to how far out it is, because that, and that's not 100% biologically correct, but that's how we model it, um, because Anywhere along that dendrite, if you have enough synapses, you generate a dendritic spike, that dendritic spike will then travel to the soma and have the same effect. So um, it's not like it's going to have less effect if it has to come further. So if you're thinking like, if you're thinking this is graded ability yeah. further out, that's not quite right. I, I, I think when you, you said they were leaky, there was kind of a... The, 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 the dendrites are leaky, but... The, all biological membranes are leaky. Right. The, but once you get a spike, the whole point of a spike is spikes don't leak. Spikes propagate despite the leaking. Right. But, but if you just do a if you do a, a, a membrane, a voltage potential, like I just drop the voltage or raise the voltage, that will leak out. 
but a spike is a self-replicating process. So yeah, that, it that follows like, along the the the, the, the nerve pill. It, it acts like a transmission line in that respect. Yeah, like, but, with, like, with like repeaters, it's like, like a repeater. So repeaters. the signal will get there. Right. It doesn't so, get degraded. The, you know, a spike is a spike, no matter how far it travels. That's like the Dr. Seuss. Anything outside that, <laughs> the green circle, essentially performs the same same role. Well, that's how we that's how we model it. Right. Any forty micron section of dendrite. We model its equivalent. Um, that is not 100% true. So I keep. I want to just say that there are lots of evidence that there are differences at different points in the dendrite. We do not model that. We don't have a theory for that yet. Um, we're going to have as part of the thymic thing I was talking yesterday, uh, just go. That model has a makes an assumption about where things are in the dendrite. Um, so that's not our theory. Isn't complete in that regard. Uh, but that's how we model it today. So if you if you see that HTM neuron, we take all those we take all of those dendritic segments. We just consider them as an array. Yeah. We don't consider their order where they occur. And, and those who study active dendrites in this part is, uh, they have the same similar concept. That here's an example of a figure that from um, one of Matthew Larkin's paper, Major Larkin and Schiller. Uh, and they had the you know you can see there's different independent zones, um, and they they. They think this is about the same as as this. You know, there might be some changes in some small changes in properties here because it's thinner, but this, essentially these are all this. You can, you know, that's the that's the way the model today. We may need to revise our model to add a little extra stuff. Yeah. So I don't think the model we have is wrong, but it's not maybe one hundred percent complete. The one big difference uh, to everything said is the stuff that's at the very top here. This apical, what's called apical tuft or apical dendrites, um, those have another really. They also have these NMDA spikes, but then there's another thing called the calcium integration zone here, and that has a very different impact, which is actually quite important. But we didn't talk about that. That's sort of like that calcium, the blue circle there or the rectangle there is is kind of like its own little integration zone, like its own little soma. Um, and instead of generating action potential, which is the main soma does, uh, that, you know, it, it generates this calcium spike thing, and so it's 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 more complicated. Yeah, we can do it in a, a future meeting. It's actually it's quite interesting what's going on there. Is is there a is a well in description of, of what that that soma does in, in some way. I mean, what the calcium integration zone does? Right, because the NDA on everywhere else is basically it raises the exit potential so the thing can fire earlier. Just is there is there an easy way to say what the purpose of the, the calcium what the purpose is or what it does? Well okay I'll okay, I'll, 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 I'll settle for the latter. <laughs> <laughs> Very easy way to say it. Um, you know, it's kind of like if, if these NMDA spikes happen, we think of it as a prediction and this neuron fires earlier. Right. Um, in this case, if one of these NMDA spikes fire, this area gets depolarized. And then if you get input, you get a very strong burst output from the cell. These oh, are okay. like five cells. So you get this like mini burst, multiple spikes in succession. That happen. Oh. So, so it, that's it, one it, example. You could say it's like, oh, it's changing the way that this cell is going to respond when it responds. Yeah, right. So it's also a type of prediction, um, but it has a very, you know, can have in there are five cells. It's burst very strong right. response. Also triggers like really strong, very quick learning throughout the cell, which is another okay really so, interesting thing. So it's, it's, it's it, there's there's a lot of layers to to what it's doing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's worth maybe another meeting, but I'm not sure if we even got to your question. Yet. Oh no, I was just I thought <laughs> my main question was like how do we model those distances? But I understand like. We're not. We're not yeah. right now. Yeah, we're not right now. But my, my follow up would be, I guess, like, how does these distances um, interplay with the idea of strengthening and weakening connections? I'm assuming that. So, so the way the basic idea here is the, the simple answer is that when a cell um, generates an action potential, the real spike, right? It creates a back action potential, which travels back along the dendrite. Okay. That's the training signal that says, okay, I actually fired now. So you guys, somebody needs to know that. So you have a training signal to say your prediction was good, something like that. That action potential is very complicated. 
because in general, it will not reach the ends of all the dendrites. So it, gets, it peters out. But the evidence suggests that the dendrite path that was recently depolarized because of a back, because of an NMDA spike, the back section potential preferentially will travel along that path and can reach the end. So in some sense, it's, it's, maybe that's not important from a theory, but from an information point of view, but what we want to do is we want one segment of the dendritic branch to go undergo training. We don't really want to train anyone else because the oil we want to do is was that predictive branch useful or not? Let's train it. If it was useful, let's make sure we reinforce it. Yeah. Um, That's this rule here. You know, when you have an NMDS spike plus this back action potential, so this BAPS, that's a training signal. Then just at that very specific segment or branch, that's where you get learning. So that's branch specific plasticity. I had some neuroscientists object to this theory. They say, oh, yes, but the back action potential doesn't go everywhere, right? And your theory requires it to go to the end of the dendrites. And then I had to, I didn't know about that other rule yet, which is like, it preferentially travels where things were recently depolarized. And so, you know, this kind of stuff comes up in the debate with neuroscientists. Um, but clearly, there has to be a training signal for those synapses at the very very ends of the dendrites. I mean, theoretically, it has to exist. Um, and so, sure enough, that they now have shown that the back action potential will reach the end of the dendrites uh, under under the right conditions. So there's just a bunch of free ions kind of hanging around after the... I don't remember the actual chemical uh, processes, Kevin. I, don't, I just remember that it happens. <laughs> that um, NMDS spike is like a lubricator. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's obviously some something hanging around, whether you say ions or if there's some channels that haven't closed. I don't remember what it is yet. Maybe look at the ion market. Yeah. But, you know, there's a tremendous amount of details about this stuff that, you know, that you make your head spin if you try to remember it all. Yeah, if you try to read this stuff, it's super confusing. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> what's important was that that they do have evidence this occurs. And if you really wanted to know, you can look it up because the one was written. I'm, there's been multiple papers on that. Okay. Yeah. It's, but it's not like plasticity might generally increase just to strengthen that branch that's significantly further away from a basal one, right? No, I, I think it's going to. It's going to go back to the point where you had generated the NDA and NDA spike, and uh, and it, it's also it's going to, in the theory says it's going to preferentially it's going to know that that's where the NDA spike occurred and it's going to preferentially um, train that one. So there's got to be not only you have to get back an extra potential and get to that dendritic segment, but that dendritic segment has to know that I'm ready to be learned, I'm ready to be trained because I just generated an NDA spike. So plasticity is not directly affected by distance? Not in our theory. Uh, I'm not saying that's true for real neurons, because there could be, there's some evidence that the, the distance along the dendrite does matter under certain conditions. We haven't incorporated that. The original question was you were trying to equate distance with abstraction. And I'm not sure we can say anything. No, I was, I was probably wrong about that. As there, are, there are some things, for example, in, the, in our sequence memory theory, uh, we didn't publish any details about how timing occurs. We just talked about the sequence, but not the timing of the elements. And the timing of the elements is essential to any sequence. Some things are longer and shorter, notes are longer and shorter melodies, different physical motions. So we have a theory about that, which we've never published, um, where that timing signal is coming in on the apical dendrites coming from someplace else. So there's a way that the, the neurons can encode. So you might say the apical dendrites in that case are detecting based on the time, I'm expecting a note now. And then the basal dendrites are saying based on the context, I'm expecting this note now. And so when you have the right time and the right context, then the actual prediction occurs. Like you know, not just what the next note is, but when it's supposed to occur, right? The basal dendrites don't encode it. We didn't have that. It wouldn't encode that timing. But the but the apical dendrites would likely be the place. And we talk about the whole theory about how that occurs. But so there, there you can see like, oh, we're differentiating one set of dendrites from another set of dendrites based on the function of what they're representing. A coincidence of coincidences. Right. Speaking of timing, it's now noon. <laughs> so I think we should.